Good morning, everyone. My name is Perry Halkidis. I'm Dean, Professor, and Director for the Center for Health Identity, Behavior, and Prevention Studies at the Rutgers School of Public Health at Rutgers University. I'm very honored to be here with you this morning to talk somewhat about the role of the closet in the lives of LGBTQ people, specifically reflections on shame and the closet in the lives of gay men across time and space. This presentation and today's symposium is in honor of Tyler Clemente. It is now 10 years since we lost Tyler from our lives. Like many young LGBTQ people, he was taken from us way too early. Today, we continue to see high rates of suicide in the LGBTQ population, as well as increased rates of homicide towards LGBTQ people especially black trans women. The lives of LGBTQ people continue to be completely put upon by the realities of our society. So as we think about the lives of gay men across the generations, it's important to note that the closet, coming out of the closet has multiple meanings. The closet provides protection, but it also enables shame. It is a tool. It is a, not a possibility for all other marginalized people to live in the closet. But for LGBTQ people, the closet provides a way to protect their lives, to protect their emotions from those who might victimize them. The decision to step outside the closet is up to the person coming out and no one else. And thus, no one should be forced out. And importantly, to our conversation today, there is no lockstep pattern for how and when someone may come out. I explored these ideas in my last book, Out in Time, The Public Lives of Gay Men from Stonewall to the Queer Generation. In this work, I try to understand what the challenges were for gay men coming out. And this idea of convergence is one that emerged very fully for me. The idea being that the identity of queer people, of the queer individual is analogous to this painting, Convergence, one of Jackson Pollock's most famous works. The landscape is comprised of three primary colors that appear to be bound to black and white contours. Conversely, the lines and shapes seem to be moving swiftly across space and time while gently intersecting. Within each juncture, different ways of coming out are engendered awaiting to converge with looming intersectionalities so as to actualize a myriad of multidimensional identities. Therefore, an identity comes with a responsibility, the lack of which creates fear and uncertainty. In the book, I documented the coming out stories, the gay identity development across three generations that I defined as the Stonewall generation, the AIDS generation, and the queer generation. I wanted to interpret the changes and the constants during the coming out experience. And I wanted to understand coming out as a lifelong process influenced by psychological realities. And importantly, to determine how gay identity development and disclosure impact the health of the individual as well as the health of the population. And to do so, I used a life stories approach to develop a better understanding of coming out and the significance of what it is to be a gay man in each generation. Personal narratives provide an understanding of the social and emotional paths throughout the generations. It allows me to situate the coming out experience during the period of adolescence to young adulthood, young adulthood and help to assure that the interaction with sociopolitical context was similar across the men in each generation. So the life stories approach provides a lens into the mind and the heart of the individual and how that particular person has made sense of their gay identity. I come back to the generations that I spoke of earlier, the first being the Stonewall generation. 
For this particular group, I interviewed five men, ranging in age from 62 to 78 years, um, and whose lives were defined by this extremely important moment in history, 1969, the Stonewall Riots in New York City, which is marked by many as the beginning of the LGBTQ rights movement. Jaundice policies fuel denial and the suppression of sexual identity, forcing many gay men of the Stonewall generation to never publicly disclose their sexual identity. The Stonewall Riots contributed to the de development of the Gay Liberation Front, as well as other gay, lesbian, and bisexual civil rights organizations. In the picture, you see two of the pioneers of the LGBTQ rights movement, Sylvia Rivera and Marcia Johnson. And Tom, one of the men who I'm interviewed for the book, talked about being a member of this generation as follows. He said, look, we grew up in an age where who we are and how we expressed ourselves as sexual beings was abhorrent, you know, and for a long time it was, you know, we were breaking the law. The next generation is the generation with which I identify known as the AIDS generation. This generation also consisted of five men who I've interviewed who were between the ages of 42 and 51 at the time of the interview. And the defining moment for these particular men was the AIDS crisis. The HIV AIDS epidemic shaped the lives of many gay men from this generation. And epidemiological data shows that men, gay men born between 1960 and 1964 were the ones who are, are most and were most impacted by HIV. Gay men of this generation lived in anticipation of existing in fear or shame in connection with distorted beliefs concerning the HIV epidemic from both the gay community and the heterosexual community. The last group with whom I spoke, I defined as the queer generation, the youngest of the three generations. Again, a total of five men from this generation, ranging in age from 19 to 20, 29. These five men were the most racially and ethnically diverse of all of those who I interviewed. The young men in this particular generation were empowered by the age of the internet and social media. And the queer generation is vastly diversified and educated in HIV AIDS, gay identity, race, and cultural differences. Many gay men from this era are not in the court accordance with a hegemonic white masculine conception that typically defines the gay population. So to understand the generations, it is very important to understand the crisis that defined each generation. The Stonewall generation, the AIDS generation, and the queer generation, while experiencing some similarities, all had a very unique crisis that defined their age group. So the generational crisis was a phenomenon that was forged by the interplay of social, cultural, political, legal, medical, and economic factors that birthed each period. I want to say up front that while I identify each generation with a crisis, when I come to the queer generation, I may reiterate this, but I want to say it up front right now, that the crisis of the queer generation also includes the crisis of the age generation and the crisis of the Stonewall generation. So for the Stonewall generation, the main crisis was the crisis of identity. The men of the Stonewall generation experienced an identity induced by an ex existential fear of forging an identity influenced and framed by the social circumstances that denounced being gay as both pathological and criminal, compelled these men from this generation to compartmentalize their personalities, creating multiple personas in order to survive. Their, their lack of authenticity or their lack of ability to be authentic with themselves created a psychological disconnect that hindered the integration of their multiple identities. Systematic oppression and social stigmatization forced many gay men into isolation or refrain from acting on their sexual desires. Why is this so? Because in many countries, including ours, there were laws that made homosexuality illegal. In fact, in the Great Britain, 
the Criminal Law Amendment Act of 1885 was used as a means to punish World War II hero Alan Turing, who was chemically castrated because of his homosexuality. Alan Turing, as we know, is the father of the modern computer and a great mathematician. With regard to this crisis and the regard to the realities of this particular generation, one of the men with whom I spoke said this, I felt afraid. I was fearful because I saw what had happened historically to gay people. But then I saw what was happening with the gay revolution. So, you know, there was fear over here. There was hope over here. And, you know, the arrow of time goes only in one direction. I thought, well, you know, eventually, but how quickly? Back then, we didn't know. My friend Felix, who's 87, I guess, 87 years old, he was a dancer. He danced with Judy Garland's boys. And yeah, I think he was arrested along with one of his friends. In fact, in 1967, a very significant documentary was produced by CBS called The Homosexuals with Mike Wallace as its host. And the message was this, the average homosexual if there be such, is promiscuous. He is not interested in nor capable of a lasting relationship like a heterosexual marriage. That was 1967, only 53 years ago when those words were uttered. The crisis of AIDS defined the generation that if I, which is my generation, uh, men born in the United States um, during the 1960s, particularly between 1960 and 1964, were most impacted by this disease. Not that men from the Stonewall generation or the queer generation are not. They were also. But it was primarily rooted in men in this age group. The HIV epidemic instilled in everyone a fear of the unknown, a precarious future or none at all. AIDS began to define coming out. Coming out is not only then tied to a sexual orientation, but to HIV status. And for many gay men who became HIV positive, disclosure of their sexual identity often accompanied disclosure of the HIV status. And so in that regard, one of the men with whom I spoke said, I recall seeing this film. It was a film on made on TV about Ryan White and it stirred up feelings of sadness. It was hard to hear about the story of this child with HIV. At that time, he was considered an innocent victim. When I heard this terminology, it made me feel shame. Back then, I felt like I was guilty, a guilty victim since I contracted the virus. This was a 53-year-old man who I named Emilio, who was talking about the Ryan White story, which appeared in 1989. Headlines like this appeared in the New York Times, and statements like this were made by Senator Jesse Helms, who said, we have to call a spade a spade and perverted human being a perverted human being, referring to gay men and the onslaught that AIDS created in the lives of gay people. Finally, the youngest generation that I have defined as the, the queer generation is defined in my mind primarily by a crisis known as the crisis of failure. The financial crisis has left an indelible, indelible mark on the lives of members of the queer generation. According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor, during 2017 to 2018, unemployment rates were particularly high for young people. For men between ages 20 and 24, it hovered around 7 and 8 percent. For 25 to 34-year-old men, the rate was around 4 percent. These numbers are certainly worse now post-COVID. And the economic crisis of the era was affected by the major political upheaval, identity politics, politics, financial and economic instability, and the chaotic nature of a post 9-11 reality, one that we face very much to this day. The economic meltdown of 2018 specifically created subpar and unfavorable life conditions, especially for gay men of color. How easy is it to come out depends like on your economic status, one of these men said. Like, can you financially support yourself if worse comes to worse? Like if you were kicked out of your home, could you support yourself? Or do you have a network of people that can help you? And location as well. If I were to come out in like Charlotte, where this person was born, or like a smaller town versus New York, there would have been difference. 
there are more services here. And if I were kicked out and be homeless, there are more services in New York than in a smaller town. But coming to now, there are more services in general. But is it easier than other generations for us to come out? Hmm, I'm not exactly sure. And Joel Stein wrote about this phenomenon of the financial crisis, the post 9-11 world for this generation, for the millennials who define most of the queer generation as follows. Their development is stunted. More people ages 18 to 29 live with their parents than with a spouse. In 1992, the nonprofit Families and Work Institute reported that 80% of people under 23 wanted to one day have a job with a greater responsibility. Ten years later, only 60% did. Very easy in this article to point the finger at the younger generation. I, on the other hand, have a different approach. Some members of the previous generation demean the experience of younger people. But I think that the, the, the crises of the younger generation, of the queer generation, are no better or no worse than the ones from before. They're just different. And young gay men coming of age now certainly have to deal with the financial realities of our time, have to deal with COVID, have to deal with an uncertain future, also have to deal with AIDS because AIDS has not gone away, and also have to deal with reconciling their gay identity. And so it is a cumulative effect that young people continue to face. And while certainly social and political conditions have in some ways become better, and media representations have put LGBTQ people in the forefront, it is still a difficult psychological process for people to come out to their families, to their friends, in their work, and in their lives. And that's what I want to attend to right now, coming out and developing a gay identity. So much of the difficulty of coming out is rooted in this concept of otherness. The challenges of being gay commences at a very young age and persists throughout the course of our lives. At the center of all of these challenges is an embedded feeling of otherness. Gay men seek to become self-actualized by integrating their gay identity with other aspects of who, who they are as people as a whole. The processes are complicated by ongoing societal conditions, but also exacerbated by the gay community itself, where conceptions of maleness and normalcy, issues of racism and other such conditions facilitate and fuel drug use and sexual risk. Otherness is a sense of living on the outside of a heteronormative society and culture, and is often how gay men understand themselves. If unchecked, it can serve as a source of loneliness and social isolation, contributing to other psychological burdens that give rise to numerous health disparities, including but not limited to HIV. Gay men's relationships and to the microsystem of families and the macrosystem of society serve as the source and weight of the otherness that we must endure. Coming out to our parents serves as an initial step for many as a means to make sense and integrate this otherness, diminishing the negative impact that feelings of other difference may have in our lives. However, this feeling of otherness just does not just fall from the sky. Gay men's feelings of otherness, feeling that something is different about them, begins at a very young age. The understanding is that otherness is an indicator of one's sexual identity. It is reinforced by social settings and groups such as families, neighborhoods, schools, communities, religious congregations, and workplaces, and within local, so state, and federal governments. Loneliness is one outcome of otherness. Loneliness is a palpable reality for gay men, which drives risk and diminishes overall physical and mental health. In 2016, in an article, journalist Michael Hobbs articulated the impact of loneliness in the lives of gay men, connecting this burden to feelings of otherness and the masking of sexual identity, the masking or the closet in which many of us live for a very long time. Loneliness doesn't truly ever go away and continues to permeate their existences even we are, when we are physically, romantically, 
and emotionally not alone. A snowball effect in which the feeling of different or other or less than or knowing but hiding leads to ongoing attempts to try to fit in and suffer the silence. So even when we're out of the closet, we are still trying to fit in because we have spent a lifetime trying to fit in. One of the men with whom I spoke says it as follows. I was kind of fooling around with a friend of mine who was on the crew team, but la la like again, was mostly like mutual masturbation and stuff. And he had a girlfriend. And then it was just, it got weirder and weirder the longer I was there because I realized that if I, that I were to come out, it was like, I look like a weirdo if I come out there. And so I got really depressed at one point about that because I feel like by the time of my sophomore year, I was like, now I just come out if I'm going to just be like the weirdo because there's no reason for me not to come out before in this place. Does that make sense? In other words, this young man was negotiating his sexual behavior with his sexual identity, but couldn't reconcile the two and didn't know if it was safe for him to come out. In fact, many individuals fear coming out. The notion of other causes many gay men to be in a state of uncertainty about coming out. Self-development, however, will be stunted if gay men are unable to embrace this otherness and integrate it with the rest of their lives. But that does not mean that one should be forced out of a closet. One should be enabled in their own time and in their own space to come out. Feelings of otherness are exacerbated and in many ways heightened by parents who portray their children's sexuality as abnormal, bizarre, and morally wrong. And as a result, many make a decision to stay in the closet until it is safe to do so. I myself, in 1981, came out as a gay man, but only after I left my home and went to school at Columbia. Here's what another man said who I interviewed. My best friend at the time, I kind of had dissociated myself with him because he came out. I mean, he was all about Madonna. His entire locker was nothing but Madonna, Madonna, Madonna. My locker was right next to him and I was all Janet Jackson. It was all rhythm nation control. You know, and so we have like dueling battles of the divas, but yet like I didn't even admit to being gay. And he was really brave. He said, fuck it, I'm gonna come out. And he did, and he was bullied. Awfully, awfully. Some member of the, of the age generation who shared that story who chose to stay in the closet because he saw what happened to his friend who came out. And so the decision about what to come out, as I stated earlier, has to be in control of the person who is living the life. And when that person feels safe and when that person feels right. So in 2010, the Guardian reported the findings of a poll conducted by Stonewall, which is a community based organization in the UK. 1500 openly gay, uh, openly LGBTQ actually people were asked about the age in which they had come out. Among older adults age 60 and above, the average age when they came out was 37 years of age. For individuals in their 30s, the average age was 21 years of age. Among people between the ages of 18 and 24, it was 17 years of age. With each generation, gay men have started to come out a younger age. Living in a more enlightened era has contributed to lowering the coming out age as generations continue to evolve. However, the LGBTQ population continues to confront the perpetual need to explain and clarify who they are since coming out is an ongoing process that lasts a lifetime. We just don't come out once. We come out our whole lives. And I challenge every heterosexual person who's listening to this or watching this to imagine a life where they had to come out as straight every time they met someone. It's sort of like you're taking hold of your identity and that tattoo, I'm owning this identity, I'm gay, I'm a man, I've got a pink triangle on me, I'm gay, it means I can't take it off. That's what Juan, who's 19 years old at the time of the interview, said about coming to, into his own being as a gay man. Gay men must go through stages of development 
from childhood to adulthood in order to reconcile their identity. They must interpret to learn who they are aside from what is directly surrounding them. For many of us, especially older gay men, there were not these media representations in front of our eyes. Then we need to internalize, to incorporate perceived knowledge into ourselves and understand that we are separate from our social and physical environments. And finally, reconciling our identities, integrating into our overall well-being, why we'll evaluate self, self, social norms, and why we seek to achieve and maintain our gay identity. Some men are able to transition from one stage to the next swiftly. However, sociopolitical conditions, cultural circumstances could delay such a process. For example, this was the case for then former governor Jim McGreevy, who kindly was able to come out in 2007 and said, I am not apologizing for being a gay man, but rather for having a personal feelings impact my decisions making and for not having had the courage to be open about who I was. Again, the challenge of living in a heterosexual, heteronormative world and wanting to aspire to a higher office such as government was not in the governor's understanding of how society worked. And so he chose to live a closeted life until he could not live a closeted life. Becoming a gay man is a unique journey that we each embark upon in our search for identity. And it's a road we take down, we take in our lives. From birth, human beings are blank canvases that come up, that come to life with each intersecting bus stroke that delineates the sexual identity of gay men. I'm proud, I'm out, and there's no hidden parts of me. It has to do with maybe my way of looking at relationships. But what it is like to be a gay man doesn't resonate all that much for me. I've been out for a very long time and sort of part of my fiber. And that was told to me by a young man named Yasser, who was able to fully integrate his identity into his being after several years of negotiating what it meant to be a gay man. Coming out for children um, is often predicated on coming out to their parents. There are no lockstep certainly easy ways to tell your parents that you're gay. This is particularly challenging for young men, young women, young trans folks who, are, who come from cultures that have very rigid conceptions of masculinity and femininity. Irrespective of generations, Telling your parents about the most intimate part of yourself never gets easier. To be clear, while parents are often tolerant, they're not always accepting. And tolerance and acceptance are not synonymous and should not be conflated. In fact, a Pew Research Institute report published in 2015 found the following. Um, that 57% of parents would not be upset if they learned their child was gay. 39% noted they would be upset in some way. And 17% reported they would be very upset. So more than half of those who were interviewed in 2015 indicated an upset. So then how safe is it for the young person to come out who probably has a very clear awareness of the feeling of the parents before even beginning the process of preparing to come out? And here's the quote from one of the men with whom I spoke, Jeremy, 26 years old at the time of the interview, who said the following. Once I did that, came out, and everybody was more accepting, it was like I said, my dad's just changed for the better. It was weird. And just being able to be myself around my family, because that's kind of where I used to be. You know, I was, I was always myself around my family. But then when I decided to accept to be me, that I was gay, I wanted to be, I wanted them to know too. And I wanted to be okay with coming out and them knowing that. Then me bringing, you know, friends over that are gay or to have a boyfriend. And while Jeremy tells a very nice, a very accepting, a very loving story of his family, and which is also the case for me, that is not necessarily the norm. 
And for many, the result is rejection from the family. And we know very clearly from the research that familial rejection is, is a, often a source of suicidal ideation for young LGBTQ people. Telling our parents is not prescribed. We are not taught the tools on how to come out. Every again, man finds a methodology in disclosing to their parents, relying on social emotional tools that create a psychological space for their identity. Most of the men who whom I spoke utilize some form of written or multimodal communication, such as letters or electronic mail or text to disclose their parents. No matter the generation, disclosing your sexual identity to our parents never gets easier, as I said earlier. And this letter is very, very telling and very illustrative um, of what, um, what many gay men go through. And this was written by Emilio, 53 years old, who wrote to his parents this letter before he went and visited them in upstate New York. He said, dear mom and dad, boy, I don't even know where to begin with this letter. It probably is the hardest thing that I will ever have to write. And I hope that someday you will understand why I'm doing this, because this is so important to me. I've decided to type it rather than write it. First of all, I wanted to thank you so much for being wonderful parents. Not only have you both come from different countries and learned to speak English, the English language, but you have also done so much more. You have raised six bright and loving children. You have also ensured our success by teaching us, all of us, to be proud, independent, and to have love for each other no matter what. The strength of love is the reason I can no longer deny this truth. I want you to know and love me for who I really am. Secondly, I want you to know at this point in my life, I have never been happier or healthier. This is the first time in my life that I can actually love myself. What I'm trying to tell you is that I am gay. You have also said that you will love your children no matter what. And I hope that you would love me even though I'm also HIV positive. This means that I have been exposed to the AIDS virus. There's a chance that I might progress to AIDS, and there's also a chance that I may not. And he continues to tell his parents the rest of the story is, is, uh, of his life in his letter. And it concludes it with love and support, all as a possibility. Many gay men, however, do not tell come out to their parents. This was the case of my husband. Some gay men never usually use, utter the words, I'm gay, to their parents. And there's an unspoken understanding that develops over time. Very common for older men, for men of the age generation and Stonewall generation who use nonverbal disclosure. Um, but it, this has seems to have fallen out of favor for younger gay men. But even with this nonverbal recognition, Pam, Pam, Pamela's and parents have to realign their relationship with their child and the process learn to emerge as parents of a gay child. When faced with challenging situations, emotions, some men take a more compartmentalized approach such as this, as keep so, in, so keeping their sexual identity separate from other aspects of their life, especially when it comes to their family. And then there are those situations when we are forced out. Now and then, the opportunity to disclose to our parents is precipitated neither by choice nor by the result of a crisis, but by the result of a crisis before the, we can uncover the truth. One narrative that I uh, heard happened to a 21-year-old. The parents needed to repair their son by sending him to a therapist when they found out by another family member that he was gay. Well, when I was 21, he decided he was going to send me to a psychiatrist to get fixed. Yep, I'm going to get fixed by Dr. M. I went to him twice in which he ultimately apparently decided to tell everything to my father that I said in sessions, which is a huge breach of ethics, as you know. The coming out experiences in relation to our families and our parents shadow so much of our lives are rooted in our feeling of difference that precedes our abilities to understand our sexuality. The fact is that for all of us, there's an ongoing challenge to negotiate our sexual identity throughout our lives. Even after our families know who we are, we continue to seek our integration of our sexual identity with all other aspects of our being and enduring an effort shaped by feelings of otherness deeply embedded in our emotional lives. I'd like to sort of take this in a different direction right now and talk about the issues of intersectionality, racism, and a closet. And let me start with a story. 
Imagine there is a race about to take place with five participants with the overall goal to make it first to the top of a steep hill. Each runner is given a vest as so to identify the individual throughout the race. The first participant is a white middle-class heterosexual man. The second runner is an African-American middle-class heterosexual man. The third is an African-American lower class, lower SES heterosexual man. The fourth is an African-American man of lower SES who's also a gay man. The fifth is an African-American man of lower SES class who, excuse me, a lower, gay, lower SES was a gay woman. Unbeknownst to the participants, their vest will basically contain extra weight, 20 pounds for every ism in each, that each participant possesses. The concept of carrying extra weight for every negatively perceived ism directly addresses the concept of intersectionality. For each ism, the individual possesses their experience of injustice increases as a whole. When interconnected, the injustice is in its entirety weighs on the person. Thus, the first participant does not carry any weight. The second carries 20 pounds for the identification of African American. The third carries 40 pounds for being African American and lower SES. The fourth runner carries 60 pounds because they are African American, lower SES, and identify as gay. Lastly, the fifth runner carries 60 pounds because not only is she African American, lower class, and gay, but a woman as well. When one implies the concepts of unearned advantage and conferred dominance, one must look at the first participants. Since he possesses all positive perceived characteristics, his vest is merely weightless material. However, all the other participants unknowingly carry the weight of their diversity. Thus, the first participant has an invisible privilege since he only needs to compete with his own body weight, a privilege for which he is not aware. One can see how racism so clearly implanted in the race as the fifth participant bears a far greater disadvantage than the first participant. The idea of intersectionality and racism may seem diametrically opposed, as inter intersectionality honors our difference, while racism, of course, does not. The multiple identities gay men hold as a lover, a brother, a father, a son, a sexual minority individual are a celebration of the intersectionality. Intersectionality informs the ongoing and evolving understanding that gay man is not a gay man, is not a gay man, is not a gay man. We are not a monolith. A gay man holds multiple identities that reflect his understanding of his own race, his own ethnicity, his own culture, his own class, and myriad other aspects of his being, including his sexual identity and gender identity. A key element of a intersectional theory is that the elements of his identities do not exist in isolation, but rather work together to shape how the individual thinks of himself. Race does not exist separately from sexual identity or class or gender identity. Rather, these identities interact and shape the realities and life conditions of a person. These identities cannot easily be split apart. And in that regard, one of the young men I spoke to from the queer generation said, as far as like my identity goes, my queer identity, it's not as bad. It's not really as bad. But then there's, like, then there's like when you're including that with my blackness, it's been pretty rough considering a lot of trans women, black trans women are being killed, being slaughtered, honestly. Like I think the 23rd trans woman was killed recently, like two weeks ago. Segregation and racism are embedded in US history and culture and are also a painful reality of the gay community. The website, www.homohistory.com, is an online archive containing a multitude of photos of gay men and lesbians from throughout history. The images on the site are powerful, beautiful, and haunting. Pictures from the past expressing the sepia-toned love stories between men and women across time and generations. Though many such photos have likely been destroyed or hidden away, those that have been uncovered and shared act as another strong piece of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer history. Reminders of those who have come before us, some of who are proud of their sexual identities, as some who felt the need to cover their true selves from the rest of the world. Behind each photo is an unknown life story, many of which will remain unknown, but will continue to inspire a challenge and create a sense of wonder. Unfortunately, these photos are also demonstrative of the painful reality of, gay, of the gay community and that of American society writ large, namely the segregation and racism embedded in US history and culture. It is nearly impossible to find an image on the site that depicts gay men of different races, cultures, or ethnicities, ethnicities together in one photograph. The images show individuals and couples who are practically doppelgangers of each other, 
much like the nearly all white cast of Friends or Girls, whose main characters, despite living in New York City in the 1990s into 2010s, respectively, socialize almost exclusively with individuals of their same skin tone. The images bring to light major challenges that we face as a society as we define who we are, namely intersectionality and racism, both of which shape the coming out process for gay men. Black and Latino sexual minority youth disclose their sexual identities to fewer people than what than white counterparts. Young ethnic minority gay men struggle to negotiate affiliation and loyalty to both their ethnic community and the gay community. Ethnic minority gay men may have trouble coming out since they also may experience heightened discrimination when they disclose their sexual identity. The coming out experience is predicated on all these intersexual identities, race, ethnic background, immigrant experience, and economic class. White gay men from families of means coming out may not be such a challenge. Gay men of color, gay immigrant men, experience various hardships related to their racial backgrounds, their ethnic backgrounds, and cultural backgrounds, and struggles informed by race, ethnicity, culture, and class. This makes the closet a safe place for many men of color and of working class and of immigrant backgrounds. It also may be for some how they develop resilience and empowerment. One of the men with whom I spoke, Juan said, Juan, who was a Latinx man, said, I actually think it made it harder for white gay men to reconcile their gay identity in a way because it's just like they're not used to feeling left out. They're not used to being stigmatized or depressed. And I like that quote because Juan used his ethnicity as a source of power and a source of pride. In that regard, Miguel, who's 30 years old, said something a little different. Being marginalized across any boundaries is going to make you hyper self-aware self of other people's issues. Like if you have lots of things to worry about, chances are you have more profound understandings of how to disentangle those problems and other people because those don't have to deal with the same sorts of issues. Again, the power uh, allowed by having to be challenged, not only because of one's sexual identity, but because of one's culture and one's race and one's ethnicity. Intersectional identities and racism, both outside and within the gay community, are intimately linked. Individuals who hold intersectional identities related to minority race and gender are not bestowed the same advantages as white gay men. Racism in the gay community is palpable. The oppressed may also oppress. And this type of racism informs the coming out process for many gay men while compounding the feelings of otherness. The objectification of gay men of color ingrained within the racism of the community occurs even more easily today with the ongoing development of new dating and hookup apps. App, dating apps. Years of oppression and communities of color within society coupled with the fetishizing and or dismissal of men of color have led to today's divisions. As a consciousness of otherness begins to emerge, especially within the queer generation, the gay community needs to be highly conscious of the otherness we perpetuate within our own populations. We must possess deeper understandings of how race, ethnicity, and intersectionality as a whole play into the experience of young men today. And one young man, Reed, who is Asian, described it as follows. I had just moved to Chicago and went in the bar by myself and got a drink or whatever, and I paid with $20. And he gave me the change back, and I was pulling it away to leave him a cash tip because that's what everybody does. And I heard him turn around to this other bartender and say that, and then he used a bad word to describe a Chinese person, over there didn't leave me any money. Be sure he doesn't get served anymore which I heard just blatantly loud. And so I emailed the management and I said, hey, I want, this I want to use this establishment. I want to come to this establishment. I'm not mad. I will still continue to support you guys being a small business and because of where I live and work in the area. But I just wanted you to know if this happened and that this was said by this person, a bartender. And their email response I got back was, quote, this is the mindset that we have in Chicago. You're going to have to get over it. We must recognize that our battles are ongoing, that the fragility of our rights that we have won over time are very fragile. And wherever we must not forget that our history and name of the efforts of the Stonewall generation to love openly and the age generation to defeat the physical and social and emotional ravages of the virus epidemic continue to this day.
The battles and advances of the past have led us to engage in the current dialogue, say, about intersectionality and gender and race and culture. But we need more than discussions. We need to put into work, we need to put to work efforts to become a community that respects our diversity and seeks to ameliorate the undue stressors that people of color and queer people experience. As the queer generation leads these efforts, it's imperative to remain aware that if we do not collectively support the lives and totality of the LGBT pop population, then we create division within our own population. Those who truly hate us will use this division as an opportunity to chip away at the progress we've made over the last 50 years. I want to conclude by talking about dignity. Dignity coming out in, in our lives and living one's life with pride is a critical important, but it is also about dignity. And I have this quote here of the late great notorious RBG who said, when a couple con contract, contracts a bakery for a wedding cake, the product they are seeking is a cake celebrating their wedding, not a cake celebrating heterosexual weddings or same-sex weddings. And that is the service Craig and Mullins, Craig and Mullins were denied. This was a uh, Supreme Court case about the, about a baker refusing to make a cake for a same-sex couple. And so these battles continue to this day. Resilience, both as a trait and a dynamic adaptive process, is something that we learn to develop. And dignity is an attribute that gay men and lesbians and transgender people and queer people are not given. It's not something we're granted. It is something that we have been earned throughout the course of our lives as we face unknown challenges. The USS Constitution was not, den was not designed to protect the lives and dignity of LGBTQ people. Many battles were fought as a means to earn our advantage and confer dignity to, to, to our population. The battles manifested in the Stonewall riots of 1969, the 1913 suffrage, parade, the Newark Rebellion of 1967, and all of these uprisings that gave voice to those who were oppressed and those who were not given equal rights under the Constitution. I'm going to uh, play this YouTube video for you just to share some more thoughts. San Diego just wrapped up its Pride celebrations, and while June is the designated Pride Month, there's an effort to continue this momentum of acceptance year-round. I'm joined now by Dr. Perry Halkidis, who is the Dean of the School of Public Health at Rutgers University and an LGBTQ health researcher. Welcome. Thank you for having me. So, as you know, June was selected as Pride Month in part to commemorate the Stonewall Riots. Can you just briefly tell us about that period of time and the significance? June 28, 1969 was a historic day for LGBTQ people. It is the day in New York City at a bar called the Stonewall Inn in Greenwich Village that LGBTQ people of all races, cultures, sizes, and shapes said to the police, you're not going to arrest us anymore. You're not going to come in and harass us anymore. And there began a multi-day set of riots where LGBTQ people fought the police and demanded that they had the right to love and live their lives openly. And that is marked as the beginning of the LGBTQ civil rights movement, happening at the same time as the African-American civil rights movement is, the women's civil rights movement happening, and it is marked, June is therefore marked as the historic um, um, indication of the beginning of LGBTQ pride, and therefore we celebrate pride in June. And you've written a book about this period, and in it you talk about the generational differences between gay men and in what ways would you say a, a gay man's experience today might differ from someone a generation before and even a generation before that? I mean, it would be very easy to say it's easier to be a gay man now than it was 50 or 60 years ago. And in some ways it is. There is There are higher levels of acceptance, although in the last few years that's also been on the downslide. Um, there are more representations in the media of LGBTQ people. However, the feeling that a young person has when they're three or four or five years old, of feeling different, of feeling othered, is pretty consistent across time. And the messages that we receive from society, that all marginalized people receive from society, including gay men, that they are lesser than, permeates every single generation. So I think the psychological process is similar. What is different is the representation of LGBTQ people in our society at large. 
You write that pride should be celebrated year round. Can you explain why that's so important? What I want is a celebration of every person, of every diverse culture, gender, sexual orientation, to fill our history books all year long. Only then do we say, look, America looks like this. Until we change that, America continues to be this sliver of white straight men. And can you tell us about, um, there's a chapter in your book where you touch on substance use and the effect of gay men's health. Um, can you expand on that? Sure. I think that what I've learned over my research program over the last two decades is that when individuals are marginalized, when they are put upon, when they experience stressors, when they experience harassment, they often don't have the coping mechanisms to deal with those negative feelings. Substance use is one way that people, not only gay men, but other folks, ameliorate those feelings, lessen those feelings. The problem is when the substance use gets out of control, it becomes a dependence. So my argument is if you want to get rid of substance use in the gay community, you have to have more tolerance and acceptance and love of LGBTQ people. And how could we as a society promote that? We can promote love and acceptance by just normalizing everybody's lives so that, that we don't have this idea that an American is one thing. An American is millions of different things. And by reacting in ways that treat everybody on an equal, equal playing field, that's how we normalize people's lives. And that's how we take away the feelings of marginalization that people experience. What needs to be done to really promote this? So we need structural interventions. And we live in, I live in one state and you live in another state that is ahead of the game. California and New Jersey are the two states in the United States that now require that LGBTQ history be taught in schools. When you start at a very young age, when you include the life experiences of Sylvia Rivera and Harvey Milk and all those LGBTQ leaders in the history books from the, and you teach young children at a young age, that's how you change a society. And you know, California and New Jersey, God bless these two states. They are so ahead of the game. Thank you so much. Thank you. Finally, um, I'd like to just put an image up here. These are images of the 23 men who I interviewed for the book, each of, told, each of whom told me their stories. I featured 15 of them, but as you can see, they're a beautiful representation of our society, of the rainbow that, the, that is the pride flag, um, and a, a shout out to them for their openness and their willingness to share their stories and often very difficult life experiences with me. I want to thank you for being here with us today. Um, if you want to follow me, that's my Twitter account and that on my research center. I also would be remiss not to call out our LGBTQ health concentration at the School of Public Health. There are many certificate programs throughout the country that teach LGBTQ health. We are the first concentration in the world. And also a brand new journal that we have launched over the course of the last two years, the Annals of LGBTQ Public and Population Health. Check these both out and uh, let's keep the lives of LGBTQ people close to our heart and remember Tyler Clemente, especially on this day and every day. Thank you very much.